Hey everyone, welcome back to another Hardware News Recap for the last week. For this one, we have some additional Threadripper information that GN has obtained and some other stuff floating around on the web out there that we were able to validate. Intel i3 chips apparently gaining hyper-threading, which is a big move for Intel, just a question of whether it's too late or not. PCIe 6 is getting some discussion as well in the past week. We talked about PCIe Gen 5 in last week's news announcement, so that's old and no one cares anymore. So PCIe Gen 6 is the new hotness that we need to talk about. TSMC is 16 nanometer lead time increasing as well, not just seven nanometer, and a couple of others like the Archer 2 supercomputer that's slated to use 11,696 AMD Epic CPUs. Before that, this video is brought to you by Linode Cloud Computing. We've trusted Linode as our web host since 2012 and recommend it for excellent technical and customer support, reliable uptime, and a clean interface. Aside from cloud hosting, Linode.com recently added GPU hosting plans for machine learning and neural net use, built with RTX 6000 GPUs and 10 gigabit per second network speeds. They're also starting to deploy Epic CPUs in their servers. Sign up for Linode.com cloud computing with code GNEXUS20 for a $20 credit or click the link in the description below to visit Linode.com slash GamersNexus. So first up, the Threadripper leaks. We already showed some data tables that we obtained previously about some of AMD's Threadripper design guides, thermal design documents specifically. Those were kind of living documents. Some small things have changed in the numbers. It's gotten more refined with age. We still don't have firm numbers on expected frequencies or boost, for example. There's been one new leak of the 3960X was the reported name, allegedly a 24 core CPU. That's not one that we received, but we saw it circulating online today. But other than that, most of the stuff we have is about the socket, the chipset compatibility, and things of that nature. So the new socket is STRX4. It is not backwards compatible with Threader for 1000 or 2000 parts. And the previous Threadripper parts, 1000 and 2000, are not forwards compatible with the new motherboards that will be coming out for Threadripper 3. And uh, separately, the socket is mechanically identical to SP3. It has some changes to the pins and what they do, the pin definitions, but the socket is mechanically the same. The STRX4 socket will host a, a codenamed product, Castle Peak, and then the CPUs for that lineup will be four channel, we've talked about this before, and DDR4 with 64 Gen 4 PCIe lanes. There's supposed to be a separate SWRX8 Threadripper product that we heard about previously, which would be an eight channel product, but we don't have any further details on that at this time. Uh, the pinout should be 4094 pins, so 4094 pins LGA for the socket. TRX40 is the chipset name for the supporting I.O., or at least the internal one, if not the external one. The 500 series chipset is uh, some terminology that was used in the documents we've seen. So AMD has referred to it as 500 series. We don't know if that'll be the public name either, but it is another internal definition. Other information we now know, Shark's Tooth is the reference design board for HEDT Threadripper. If you see that name circulating around, that's what AMD provides to the board manufacturers as a reference board. It went out, in theory, it went out in the first half of 2019 or maybe right in the middle in the summer. And then T-Control, at 95 degrees Celsius will be where thermal throttling is exhibited on the CPU. That's T-Control, so there might be a T-Control offset again for those parts, and we don't have a firm number on what that is yet. And then for TDPs, which we published a massive piece on TDPs, you should please definitely watch. If you haven't, you'll learn a lot from it. But we'll go through those numbers anyway. So TDP, the new Threader for 3 CPUs are supposed to be up to about 280 watts for AMD's definition of TDP and down to about 180 to 190 watts. The T case for the formula used on these products ranges between 65 and 80-ish degrees Celsius, depending on which processor group you're talking about. It's A, B, or C, they have three processor groups, and that'll be uh, something about 190 watts and 280 watts at the top end. And further, HSF Theta CA, or the heat sink fan thermal resistance, if you want to use normal words, is between 0.12 and 0.14 as defined in AMD's formula. We're avoiding giving firmer numbers here because we're not 100% sure what numbers AMD slightly tweaks to out their, the leakers of documents, but that gives you some fairly confirmed numbers without being too specific on them. And uh, separately, again, there was that 24 core CPU rumor. As for the compatibility, as mentioned earlier in this piece, that was something we talked about last week, but we weren't sure about, and now we've 
been able to confirm it with a couple of separate sources independently of the original rumors. So it does not sound like this new product, new driver for product will be backwards compatible and the old ones won't be forwards compatible. Next up, Intel's i3 chips will gain hyper-threading. So Intel has historically segmented its features based on price. And hyper-threading has been no exception to this. Just last year, for example, there was a lot of discussion about the Intel i7s, like the i7-9700K, which got rid of hyper-threading. That's a CPU lineup that has historically hosted all of the high-end features, including hyper-threading. So it was a big change and one that supported Intel's shift of branding towards the i9 series as the flagship rather than i7. Now though, as AMD continues to ratchet up the competitive pressure, Intel's forced to make some changes and the newest rumors suggest, this is not one we have independently verified, but new rumors suggest that Intel will be hyper-threading uh, on its lower end i3 CPUs, so that would, it's just, it's SMT, it's Intel's flavor of SMT, and the i3s and the low end CPUs continue to be where Intel struggles the most against and the Intel's got some pretty strong arguments for the 9900K. We'll see how the HEDT X series stuff does. The 3175X is an extremely good processor, very expensive, so completely different price category. But Intel does reasonably in the high end. They have some good arguments for them. The low end is where Intel's been weak for the last couple of years, and this i3 change might help Intel there. So as found by well-known hardware leaker uh, TUM APISAK on Twitter, there's a new submission in the SciSoft Sandra database that shows an i3-10100 with a 3.6 gigahertz base clock. Most interestingly, it's a four core, eight thread part. The i3-10100 is presumably part of Intel's upcoming Comet Lake based on 14 nanometer plus, plus, plus silicon. That's the actual proper naming, not being tongue in cheek there. If this holds true, then Intel will be selling a core i3 part with the same configuration that used to be limited to flagship i7 SKUs just a few years ago. Past rumors have also suggested that the upcoming i9 SKUs will be up to 10 cores and 20 threads. We now know that the X series, in the very least, has its floor processor, its lowest end one, at about $600 for the 1K unit pricing at 10 cores and 20 threads. So that's manifested as reality. We're not sure if that'll come to desktop yet, but $590, although obviously very expensive for 1K unit pricing and will be a bit higher for retail, that's sort of in the ballpark of a 9900K. So we're not sure if it'll step down into desktop from there. But either way, that's what we're looking at now for Intel's lineup uh, and the four core eight thread option for an i3 would be a pretty serious shakeup. It just, it comes down to whether Intel also keeps the same pricing, the original pricing, or at least stays within bounds of it. If they're bringing an i3 down to an i7 spec, but increasing the pricing substantially, then that doesn't change anything. So we'll see, we'll keep an eye on that one. The next one, Intel's 10 nanometer desktop plans aren't dead. This, is a, this isn't a rumor, but it's an Intel response to a rumor. And the rumor began to run rampant earlier in the week, originating from German hardware outlet, uh, Hardware Lux. The site had claimed to have reliable information from insider circles that Intel was planning to completely kill its 10 nanometer desktop CPU plans. And it would opt to instead wait until 2022 for seven nanometer CPUs. And a quick, very quick aside here, as Intel and AMD define seven and 10 nanometer or TSMC as it may be, they're not one-to-one, -one. so it's not just seven's better than 10 or 10's better than 14 necessarily if it's between two different fabs. Uh, so Intel 10 will be more comparable to what AMD is doing on seven, but then there's other discussion points there too. We won't get into all of that today. Anyway though, that was the rumor. And seemingly the rumor pegged lower expected frequency than expected frequencies on 10 nan nanometer as the reasoning for Intel's uh, alleged decision to kill the platform on desktop. So Intel has refuted the rumor. Typically companies don't really reply to rumors at all, but this one they did. And Intel said, quote, we continue to make great progress on 10 nanometer and our current roadmap of 10 nanometer products includes desktop. What seems to have given the rumor traction is just how long it's taken Intel to get 10 nanometer to a point where it's doing anything. And they're still not volume shipping in desktop, obviously, otherwise we'd be talking about it. And it's only really shipping in mobile parts in the form of Ice Lake right now. There's also the aforementioned Comet Lake, which is yet another iteration of 14 nanometer and another derivative of Skylake. 
there's then also the rumor of Rocket Lake, which is supposedly set to debut in 2021 and should be based on yet more 14 nanometer silicon if the present rumors are to be believed. So the defunct Cannon Lake part doesn't really paint a pretty picture for Intel's 10 nanometer ambitions, and that's why this rumor took root and was able to expand so much in a couple of days. So ultimately, Intel has been pretty tight-lipped about what its 10 nanometer desktop plans are and when they might land. For now, we'll have to take Intel at its word face value because we don't really know any more than what's been said. And the statement to Tom's hardware was decidedly initially ambiguous and left some weasel room for what exactly that phrasing meant with regard to still making 10 nanometer desktop products. But uh, Intel has commented as much as they can. And we don't know, for instance, if 10 nanometer desktop parts by Intel's definition will include all HEDT mainstream desktops, that'd be i3, i5, i7, and so forth, i9, uh, and NUC parts, or maybe just one of them, and we'll keep an eye on that as well, along with the previous story. PCIe Gen 6 looks good for 2021 in the next story. We talked about a PCIe Gen 5 demo last week, but again, that was a whole week ago, so no one cares about it anymore. PCIe Gen 6 was originally announced last June, just after the PCI SIG group finalized the PCIe 5.0 specification. However, at the time, the specification for Gen 6 was little more than a draft. Now, it's already seen significant progress, as the PCI SIG has issued an update stating that PCIe Gen 6 has officially entered version 0.3. The technical details, such as bandwidth, throughput, technology, haven't changed since the original announcement. Rather, the announcement seems to serve as a mile marker for development, ensuring that the specification looks good for a 2021 finalization, as PCI SIG wants to avoid the long gestation period between PCIe as endured between versions 3.0 and 4.0. So trying to shortcut that this time. And a quick reminder that the specifications for these things, just like memory, like DDR standards, get ratified before you'll start seeing them on boards, especially in the consumer space. So this stuff is typically several years out once you talk about a spec getting ratified because it then needs a platform that supports it, CPU that supports it, and it needs motherboards that will support it. So we're a ways out on that, but point three, for Gen 6 uh, was the newest mile marker. Next up, TSMC in the news again, and it's 16 nanometer lead time increasing. We previously talked about how TSMC's 7 nanometer lead time had increased, which posed some challenges for a lot of the big customers of TSMC, but mostly the smaller ones who don't have quite as much sway as, say, Apple, or even AMD is one of the larger customers at TSMC for 7 nanometer. So, TSMC had tripled its production lead time for 7 nanometer as a result of the higher demand than supply can match. And for reasons that aren't readily apparent, it seems that TSMC is now also extending its lead time for 16 nanometer. So per Digitimes report, even TSMC's less advanced nodes are seeing increased demand and limited capacity. Digitimes also notes that, quote, TSMC has already seen its 16 nanometer chip supply fall short of demand. TSMC's 16 nanometer node has been in production since 2013, so a sudden stretch in production and lead time is interesting. It's possible that the fab is overloaded, or there may have been a slight disruption in production. Earlier this year, for instance, TSMC had to scrap thousands of chips due to contaminated photoresist chemicals. The TSMC is also embroiled in a legal dispute with Foundry Peer Global Foundries, although that likely isn't hindering chip production yet. If you previewed the title for this specific segment and the timeline, you'll see that Aldi wants to sell you a gaming PC with your groceries. So you, you read that right. Uh, purveyor of affordable foodstuffs, Aldi, now has a gaming PC to sell, and it's called the Median Gaming PC, desktop PC. It should start around 949 uh, British pounds, or about 1,200 US dollars. Admittedly, Walmart set the bar pretty low for generic big box store gaming computers, so there's plenty of room for Aldi to try and step it up. It seems as if the company is partnering with Median Eraser to offer gaming PCs on its website, as the gaming PCs aren't presently in the Aldi stores. Median Eraser is owned by Lenovo. It also sells PCs at places like Costco, uh, presently, the Aldi computer, as we're aware, is shipping from the UK-based website, and we're not 
Uh, we don't think it's available in the U.S. at present or know if it will come to the U.S. The median gaming PC will come with an i5-9400. It'll have 16 gigabytes of DDR4-2666 memory, no further specs on that. It's got a one gigabyte PCIe SSD and a GeForce RTX 2060, putting it one generation newer up to modern times than the Walmart PC was. There's no indication as to what motherboard is being used, really to no one's surprise. These, typically they don't specify that because the supply might change and they don't want to lock it down to one. There's also no information on the power supply, but we do know that it comes with a three year warranty. So if you, for some reason, wanted one of those computers, you can get it. The Archer 2 supercomputer will utilize 11,696 AMD Epic CPUs. In the next story, in another supercomputer win for AMD, Epic CPUs will be powering the new Archer 2 for UK Research and Innovation, or UKRI. Archer 2 will be built by Cray and will succeed the original Archer supercomputer. And a bit of fun information for you, Cray, if you don't know the name, is basically the OG supercomputer builder. We have an old video of a, a tour of the Mountain View, California Computer History Museum. It's a really cool place. You should go if you live near or visit. But we have a video in case you can't. And it's so old that it's probably only got a couple thousand views on it at this point. But one of the machines we show in that video is uh, a set of Cray supercomputers from when they were initially built. And the main one we looked at was actually water-cooled. So that was uh, pretty impressive for the time and was not something that you found in consumer computers in the very least. Archer 2 will consist of 5,848 Shasta compute nodes, as they're called, with each node boasting two Epic ROM CPUs, 64 cores each, for a total of 11,696 CPUs. That's 748,544 cores clocked at 2.2 gigahertz and almost 1.5 million threads. Archer 2 is being built in the same area that houses the current Archer supercomputer, meaning that there will be a period of downtime for the transition. Archer is set to go down on February 18th, 2020, and Archer 2 is set to boot up on May 6th, 2020 as well. We've got some of the Archer 2 supercomputer specifications as well, quoted from HPC Wire, and this will all be in our news document linked below if you'd like to see that written out, but I'll hit a couple of the important ones here. First of all, peak performance is estimated at 28 petaflops. System design uh, lists, again, 5848 compute nodes. It mentions uh, 1.57 petabytes of total system memory, if you were wondering where some of the memory has gone. There are uh, 23 direct liquid-cooled cabinets for the supercomputer. There's 14 and a half petabytes of luster work storage in four file systems. And then they've got a whole bunch of other information in here as well that you should check out in the show notes, uh, debugger information, things like that. It also lists, quote, 16 next generation AMD GPUs, although we're not positive what those are at present. And that'll be with uh, four compute nodes attached to those. So that's the news for the week. Thanks for watching. Subscribe for more. Go to store.gamersnexus.net to support us directly. We just restocked our uh, blue pint glasses with the gold rim. If you'd like to pick one of those up with the GN teardown logo on it, it's got cool stuff in the design like MOSFETs, inductors, VRM components, things like that. And that's on the store. Or you can just go to patreon.com slash gamersnexus helps out there. Thank you for watching. I'll see you all next time.